Hey, what about Major Kong? sermon about old man Adam. That's me. I don't mean the Adam in the Bible, Adam. I don't mean the Adam that Mother Eve elated. I mean the thing that science liberated. Well, I was interested in whether or not I was going to get blown up by an H-bomb prior to uh, Lolita. My uh, interest intensified itself sort of concurrently with that. I believe that the Berlin crisis took place during uh, Lolita. He had been very disturbed by the Cuban Missile Crisis. Not simply the prospect of nuclear annihilation, not simply, but also by the way that people accepted it fatalistically, that that's probably how the world was going to end, in a huge nuclear bang. Kubik realized that this stuff was so incredible that it could only be taken in and absorbed through a comic lens, through a satiric lens. Monsieur has been lost! So listen, folks, here is my thesis. Peace in the world, or the world in pieces. Hiroshima, Nagasaki, Almagordo, Bikini. Kubrick took on the project as producer. He understood that he had the opportunity to really stand out by himself as a writer, producer, director, and as an independent working within the studio system. And these, these were the kind of uh, the end times to some degree for the, for the studio system. A number of independents were making their mark. Stanley Kramer, of course, John Cassavetes. So I think Kubrick saw this as an opportunity to benefit from having one foot inside the industry, but also seeking to preserve his independence as a, as a creative artist. Film directing, I think, is a misnomer for uh, anybody that seriously wants to make films because directing the film is only, you might say, one-third of the uh, process. You know, writing the film, directing the film, and then editing the film is, you might say, the whole job. You know, I do the cutting myself. With the exception of a few directors, most people have their film edited by film editors as they go along. And then when the film is done, they look at the film and dictate some notes about it, and the film editor tries to do what they say, and then maybe they look at it again, and they do it again. But if you really want to do it right, you must do it yourself. Unlike Alfred Hitchcock, who fastidiously, through his storyboards and through his scripting, was almost line for line perfect in his setups and the final cut. Kubrick, of course, would have an outline of a script, a scaffold, something he would develop with other writers. But when it came to dressing a set or when it came to actors rehearsing and rehearsing on set, sometimes dialogue, sometimes acting would lead to innovation, lead to some surprises. So Kubrick um, often created a space in which people could bring their own kind of creative impulses and because he took so many takes often, that perhaps nuances and variations from the script would come about in that magic in front of the camera. Try one of these Jamaican cigars, Ambassador. They're pretty good. Thank you, no. I do not support the work of imperialist stooges. Oh, only commie stooges, huh? Stanley's philosophy is, is uh, sim simplicity, although he was very keen on his technology. He often said, I wish I could just get in a car with a couple of people and go off and make a movie. Motion picture black and white, I believe, is the hardest photographer. You don't just turn the colour off. The big challenge with black and white is getting the depth in black and white. If you light black and white softly, with soft light, flattens the picture out completely. If you want to make somebody coming out of the shadows, it's creating the shadows for people to come out. The war room, the magic of that scene is the blackness. The art of having no light. Colour would have ruined Dr. Strangelove. I think it had to have that harshness about it, which uh, the black and white did, more factual, more documentary look to it, which it did. Colour would have made it pretty, which it was not. 
Stanley Kubrick was very fond of just having practical lighting and using the lighting that would naturally appear in sets. Fuck, should I get it? It gives a, a natural uh, atmosphere to things rather than hard um, directional lighting. I mean, you just get a much more natural atmosphere to things, I think. One great thing of working with Stanley was um, you, work, you work with him, you didn't work for him. He um, re respected you, um, he respected your opinions and your work, I, I know, which, which was wonderful. Gentlemen, you can't fight in here, this is the war room. Much of the action in Doctor Strange Love takes place in the now legendary War Room. Although no such place actually exists, Kubrick insists that the set reflect a totally realistic atmosphere. He reviews Ken Adams' initial sketches for the War Room set. He loved it. He said, that's exactly right, you know, you've got it. And then I said, you know, yeah, everybody is telling me this man is so difficult to work with. And, and in my first combination with him, I seemed to be getting there. So I was so optimistic. And then, as always with Stanley, about three or four weeks later, we are driving to Shepard, and he said, gee, Ken, I've been thinking about that moral. You put it on two levels, and what am I going to do with the 70 extras on the upper level? And I think you have to rethink your concept. Uh, I had to start from scratch. I tried to calm down by taking a walk in the grounds at Shepard Studios. And, uh, after I was sufficiently calmed down, started doodling again on, on, on different uh, ideas. Adam designs a set that will become legendary. To build the war room, he employs more than 150 tradesmen. The set measures 130 feet long, 100 feet wide, and 35 feet high. The centerpiece is a table 22 feet in diameter. Adam and his team must also create a set of the interior of a B-52 bomber with no cooperation from the US military. I found a book called The Strategic Air Command by Mel Hunter. And on the front of it had the one picture which we desperately needed was not a very good picture, but a picture of the interior of the B-52 cockpit. And that was our starting point. We then had to really invent everything from then on. Peter was brilliant in because I more or less handed that whole interior over to Peter and he spent hours and hours on switches and morning lights, which fascinated uh, Stanley. Merton's designs are realistic enough to cause concern in unexpected circles. The publicity people invited some American Air Force personnel to, to look at the shooting we did. And they literally went white when they saw the inside of the B-52 because they said it was absolutely correct. So the next day I got a memo from Stanley. He hopes that I've got all my research from legal sources or from justifiable uh, sources because otherwise I and he could be in serious trouble uh, with a possible investigation by the uh, FBI. Well, boys, I reckon this is it. Nuclear combat toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Ruskies. The most famous image from Dr. Strangelove, the phallic symbol of Slim Pickens riding the bomb, presumably to a nuclear orgasm, almost did not occur. The sequence was an 11th hour inspiration of Kubrick's, much to the chagrin of production designer Ken Adam. It was a brilliant idea, except uh, I hadn't allowed for it. The Bombay was completed. The Bombay was enormous, 60 feet long, and suspended from the grid on the big stage at Shepparton. But it didn't have practical bomb doors, because we never intended to see. I said, well, when you need it by? And he said, uh, well, I really ought to shoot it in 48 hours and two days. And I said, Stanley, even if I work three shifts, day and night, to make these bomb doors practical, we'll never do it in that time. And I talked to special effects man, Wally Weavers. I mean, it's a black and white picture. He said, we take a black and white still of the inside of the bomb bay, and I cut out the bomb bay doors. And then Slim Pickens was sitting on the bomb with blue backing. We shot it from a crane and 
crane back and then optically reduce the bomb until it exploded into the missile site. And so it was a very simple solution. During the final editing, we were about to dub the film, and the last reel of the film, which is the most complicated, which is the bomb run with Slim Pickens, which is hundreds of little cuts, it vanished from the labs, and it never was found. Oh, I was devastated. Because it had taken months to cut, it was enormously complicated. So I had to recut the whole bloody thing in about two weeks from memory. And I remember Stanley did this brilliant thing of cutting up the script and everything was put on cards on an enormous board and we reconstituted the whole thing and started from scratch. As Kubrick prepares to screen Dr. Strangelove for critics, he finds the film has a rendezvous with destiny. The screening date is November 22nd, 1963. Like everything else in America, the events of November 22nd, 1963, John F. Kennedy's assassination moved everything, shook everything up. We decided for uh, obvious reasons that we better cancel the uh, preview. Stanley was there and Stanley uh, readily agreed in fact, he may have even been the first one to suggest canceling, but San Stanley had a more specific reason, because unlike the rest of us, Stanley knew the dialogue. Our president has just been assassinated, and now we're going to see uh, the president of the United States portrayed in the film, having to make momentous decisions about the future of not only his country, but of the whole world. And it was very much uh, in everyone's mind as to how the public would react to this so soon after. As a result of that, there had to be a bit of post-synchronization looping of the dialogue because Slim Pickens talks about a fella having a pretty good time in Dallas, which got looped to Vegas. One issue of prophylactic, three lipsticks, three pair of nylon stockings. Shoot, a fella could have a pretty good weekend in Vegas with all that stuff. Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, opens in the United States on January 30th, 1964. The film is a critical and commercial success in New York and London. Ultimately, Dr. Strangelove turns an impressive profit on its $2 million production costs, and in February of 1965 is nominated for four Academy Awards, including Best Picture, Best Actor, and Best Screenplay. The world did not know what to do with Denny, so as a default, they <laughs> applauded, and it turned out that it was the right thing to do. What Kubrick demonstrated within the studio system and into the future was his capacity to deliver a product that would be commercially successful. Well, it's good that you're fine and, and I'm fine. I agree with you. It's great to be fine. <laughs> and that would stand the test of time. There was something about him being able to produce work that touched on themes and aspects of human society and behaviour that met with an international audience. And what's surprising and remarkable about those films is that they still speak intergenerationally across audiences and internationally today. So much a part of American culture that Stanley Kubrick's vision influences even the highest circles. I, Ronald Reagan, do solemnly swear. Reagan, when he became president of the United States, asked his chief of staff, to look at the war room in the White House. And the chief of staff, Mr. President, uh, there is no such thing in the, war room, in the White House. And Reagan said, but I saw it in, in that film, uh, Dr. Strangelove. We meet again. Just like you.